Hello, dear friends, and welcome to the GeoCoast. Uh, today I'm meeting with the Chief of Staff of the Irish Defence Forces, Vice Admiral Professor Mark Mellet. Hello, Mark. Max, how are you? It's good to see you. Thanks for this opportunity to talk. And um, Mark, I know that for most of your life, uh, before you became the Chief of Staff in the Irish Defence Forces in 2015, you've been serving in the Navy. So what is your personal connection with the sea? Why did you choose this career? But I suppose I came up, I grew up in uh, the west of Ireland in Castlebar, County Mayo. It's only 11 miles from the sea. And I don't think there's any part of Ireland really that is that far from the sea. Although sometimes uh, I don't think we've actually really understood how much an island nation we are. A nation with such a rich maritime heritage and also such a rich maritime jurisdiction. So it was only a matter of, I suppose, a natural course that I applied for the Defence Force at the time and I was uh, offered a cadetship in the Naval Service. Um, I, I think growing up in the west of Ireland, uh, you cannot be but um, taken back by the beauty of your landscape and also the seascape. And there is perhaps, I sense, and maybe I'm biased, nowhere else where that is best reflected in the wonderful coastline of Mayo, from Slyne Head up towards Northwest Mayo, up around towards um, Sligo and Innescroen, but in particular areas like Ackle Island, Clue Bay, um, Golden Sand Beach, but as well as uh, areas like Clare Island and all the islands of Clue Bay itself, and in particular the beautiful Ackle. It's a wonderful coastline running up to Eagle Island, which is um, a beautiful feature off the west coast. Mm -hmm. And do you have any history in your family serving in the military in the army? I, I do in, in the context of the War of Independence uh, and actually the Civil War. Um, two of my uncles, my granduncles, were quite formidable in terms of the, um, the effort at that time. And when I look back at my own institution of Oak Lake Nahirn, uh, you know, the fact that my granduncles were part of that institution that stood up and actually regained our sovereignty back in that lead up to uh, almost 100 years ago when we, we gained our sovereignty. It was probably inevitable was in the blood, but I suppose in terms of my parents, neither were associated with military nor was my grandfather, but my grandmother and her brothers were very much involved in uh, Oak Lake Nahirn uh, and coming them on. Mm -hmm. And can you please describe what would be the main current role of the Irish Navy, Naval Service and how this have evolved from the time when it was founded in 1946? Yeah, well I suppose uh, our primary role in the Defence Forces is to um, be part of the bedrock of this sovereignty of our state. I mean we, we are a capability um, tasked by government with the defence of the state and um, people often say well where is the enemy? Well sovereign rights that are not upheld are more imaginary than real and Ireland is gifted with a massive maritime resource, almost a million square kilometres where we have sovereignty or sovereign rights one of the largest food producing ecosystems and renewable energy environments on the planet. An extraordinary resource whereby we have sovereignty over the sub seabed and uh, resources and we also have the potential in particular on the renewable energy side of a significant opportunity for an offshore wind and I think in also in due course offshore wave whereby we could become if you like the energy hub for Europe. We have a very rich resource in terms of fisheries, which is actually shared with our partners in the context of the EU um, uh, institution, and that's exercised through the common fisheries policy. But I often say, and it's a point of discussion, the fish that swim in our jurisdiction in the first instance are Irish fish. They're actually, uh, uh, they're the sovereign right sits over there from the citizens of the country, and it's not until there's a transfer of the property right of that fish uh, through the institutions of the common fisheries policy do they become the property of somebody else and that's on the basis that they're actually properly uh, I suppose recovered and uh, in, in accordance with that institution of common fisheries policy. Mm -hmm. And um, like the Irish Navy is one of the youngest naval services in the world, yeah? it's set up in 1946. Yes. yes. Yeah? And what was the origin of maritime traditions adopted by the island's naval, naval service? Well, I suppose if we roll back, you know, um, we sometimes forget our heritage. And when I look back, I see three great heroes that were there in terms of St. Brendan, um, who was Brendan the Navigator, who was formidable in the context of his capacity to actually explore the seas. And more recently then, um, we had Grania Whale, the Pirate Queen operating out of my own county, out of Clare Island and a remarkable story of a formidable leader on the maritime who actually understood the maritime 
and actually used the maritime to her own advantage. Um, so much so that actually she, she visited the Queen uh, sailing up the Thames and um, a, a, a remarkable character. And more recently then we had the likes of Admiral William Brown from my own county again, from mm -hmm. Oxford, um, who actually was the founder of the Argentine Navy and a key player in terms of the independence of that state. So looking back at that heritage in terms of our, um, where this state has come from, when the state was formally founded uh, in 1921 and uh, uh, 22, Article 6, I think, of the treaty said, until we had the wherewithal for our own, own coastal defence, that would be provided by His Majesty's uh, armed forces. So, in, to some degree, our state stood up and it was institutionalised in terms of our defence forces with a capability that covered both uh, land and air, but not the maritime. And it wasn't until, I suppose, the lead up to what was called the emergency, but in fact, the Second World War, that I suppose the question began to be asked uh, with regards to formalising a Navy. And that was done in 1946, as you've rightly said. And out of that then, we began to grow our traditions. Naturally speaking, a lot of our traditions were inherited from our nearest neighbour, um, uh, the Royal Navy. And many of us actually had the, the um, the benefit of training with the Royal Navy and we have adopted many of their traditions in our own uh, organisation but the Royal Navy traditions are actually peppered through most navies if you look at it in terms of you know simple things like piping the side, uh, areas with regards to doctrine, very much the Royal Navy would be seen as a leader in the context of the development of maritime operations and it's only natural that you would look at uh, replicating what is good and actually building on and shaping it to your own side. So the Defence Forces, and in particular Naval Service today now, is a, a balanced fleet uh, of nine ships, which is tasked by government with a maritime defence and security operations, upholding our sovereignty, but also being a, an agent to deliver security service to other actors such as Gardaí and uh, Revenue Service of Customs, and also government services departments such as the Sea Fisher Protection Authority and others. Mm -hmm. and what is the history mark around the military ranks in the Irish Navy where the system was adopted? Is it adopted from yeah, the Royal I, Navy? I, yeah, I think most of them are very much the, the they're, they're a, I suppose a hybrid of a Royal Naval ranks but also US Naval ranks I and mean, we have the rank of Ensign which doesn't exist in the Royal Navy but it does exist in the American Navy. Uh, we have uh, our own ranks since then, also that are marrying across in terms of the ranks within the other arms of the Defence Forces in terms of the Army and also the Air Corps. So there's a commonality in terms of the ranks, although we knew, use naval uh, expressions to denote them, there is um, a read across between our Naval Service, our Army and our Air Corps. And another question related to development of kind of maritime traditions would be, what is the history with the naval uniform? Has it changed much since 1946 and where it, was it adopted again the style from the Royal Navy? Or? Yeah, it, it very much is similar to the Royal Navy but a few peculiarities that would be unique uh, to ourselves. We have a bobbin on the actual uh, unlist, enlisted ranks uh, cap in terms of junior enlisted ranks caps. We have the what we call the fore and aft and the square rig. The square rig primarily is what's wor uh, worn by a uh, junior enlisted ranks within the Defence Forces and the square rig is simply similar to what I am, uh, sorry, the, the fore and aft is similar to what I'm wearing at, at present. And, and that is very similar to what is in the Royal Navy in the context of this uniform I wear now. Um, and uh, that has evolved, but it, not very much. Um, there are areas, I suppose, in terms of our working dress that have changed and are changing and now we're about to trial a new um, pattern of material for our uh, personnel, in particular those who would be in, in working rig at sea and ashore, and I'm looking forward to seeing that being introduced as a, on a trial basis, and that will show the evolution. Critically speaking is, um, I think in any organisation, in particular in any military, it's important that uh, the members of that Defence Force actually are proud of their uniform, and you must stay up with the times in terms of evolutions in the uniform itself to make sure that that pride in, in terms of individuals and that a move with times is actually captured in the context of the changes you make. You have already touched base on this um, in one of the previous questions, but I, I'm just wondering if you can think of more examples. So what I wanted to ask is like, are there any maritime traditions associated with the Navy, which would be cutting across borders and jurisdictions? 
Can you think of any traditions that would be respected by all mariners worldwide? Well, I think perhaps the, the most important piece is our, our key enabling marriage, which is people and hard hardware, which is in the ship, the sovereign ship, which is, which is uh, a warship. And people often you know, have suggested that we don't have warships in the uh, Irish Naval Service. Absolutely we do. The institutional requirements of a warship are that, first of all, the ship should be on the state register, and secondly, it must be under the command of an officer who is on the commission list of the forces of that state. So that's a common standing under international law, the Law of the Sea Convention, and it actually is a standard throughout uh, all navies. And the freedoms and the respect given to a warship are such that it actually is held in respect. It's a piece of sovereign territory wherever it travels. And um, as we speak now, one of our ships, the Samuel Beckett, is preparing to actually travel to the United States to represent the interests of government across all the lines in terms of political, mm -hmm. the diplomatic, the economic. And, and that, I suppose, usage of naval assets in that manner is an example whereby it is a common trend in all, uh, I suppose, normal navies. You know, some navies may not have developed it to the extent that perhaps uh, larger navies have, but we're, I think, since 1986 when we first crossed the Atlantic with Eli Etna, where I was uh, privileged to be a member of that ship's company, we have done it more and more. And um, that unique status of a naval vessel is a, a key enabler in terms of those softer sides of diplomacy. Of course, you know, there are other uh, types of operations whereby naval platforms are unique in that they have a freedom of travel almost over 70% of the globe where you don't have to seek permission mm -hmm. because you have the rights of nav freedom of na navigation that, that are... applies to all navies in the world. That applies to all navies and there are obviously um, per certain caveats that come in in terms of the actual influence of a state. But you know, the right of innocent passage is a norm and it's very important that that is upheld and protected so the ships can travel around without interference. Now obviously there, when you come into the, the sovereign space of a state, there are certain obligations with regards to uh, your, your notification if your navigation is not uh, innocent passage through the waters. But uh, that, that is codified in terms of, terms of communications with the state, informing in advance diplomatic notes and, and so on. And what about small things like, for example, ship's bell or the compass would they be cutting across borders as well? Every Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, people, you know, the sophistication in terms of technology is rapidly moving in ships of all types. And there's almost um, very little difference in terms of the types of technology used by naval vessels as well as merchant marine vessels. And one of, that's one of the, um, I suppose, advantages of Ireland's approach to the maritime that we have actually married and aligned our merchant navy with our uh, military navy in a manner of true the, what's happening in the National Maritime College which is a, a joint venture between the Naval Service and Cork Institute of Technology and we then actually have the opportunity to l learn of each other. I remember many years ago in the Naval Service it was like we had two silos, the merchant navy sitting over there, the military navy sitting over here and near, near the twain should meet. But it is such a, a, a development, a positive development, and something that informs an awful lot of what I do now today, the importance of collaboration. And working in silos uh, in today's modern world is suboptimal. It lacks, it undermines efficiency, it undermines effectiveness, and it also undermines trust. And we've learned so much over the decades from the Merchant Navy. And likewise, I think there are some of our practices that have been uh, accepted by the Merchant Navy, so that there is a, a reciprocity in terms of knowledge. And that goes beyond just the maritime side, it also goes between our ability to be part of that triple helix with the Navy uh, on, as one leg of a stool, the research and the higher education institutes as a second leg of a stool, and increasingly linking up with enterprise and uh, maritime related companies that would actually have an interest in, in leveraging new technologies and new ways of doing things. And that's what's happening in terms of our partnerships with University College Cork, uh, Cork Institute of Technology and a plethora of other institutions throughout the state. And also working with um, small and medium enterprises, uh, foreign direct investment uh, companies in some cases, and this, this ability to have the, an outcome that is actually greater than the sum of the parts. And I, and I deviated there back on the whole phrase of collaboration and working together. One, way or, one place where Ireland is to the forefront is certainly the way we've actually got our merchant navy and our military navy working cheek by jowl. 
because it is actually makes us a better state in the context of developing our expertise within the uh, state itself. And you have partly touched base on this as well, like, but so can you think specifically in the context of maritime traditions, which traditions would be cross-cutting cross between military and merchant navy? Yeah. Even I, like we're talking, thinking, tra traditions, I mean, so, so, some things which go back in centuries and which continue. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, some of the bases of how we navigate still remain in terms of boats. We, we, we all, uh, we can become obsessed with technology, but there are some fundamentals. I mean, we don't know when GPS might be switched off, mm. and that could happen at any time. We don't know when there could be other means to actually interfere with your radio navigation aids. So the critical importance and at, at the center of all our learning are some fundamentals with regards to basic coastal navigation, basic astro navigation, being able to find your position in terms of using the stars and the planets. It's quite a mm -hmm. sophisticated uh, exercise, quite, um, a challenging uh, mathematical calculation, but you can do that and you can actually fix your position with relative accuracy from the stars, uh, in particular at that critical moment uh, when you can see the horizon and still see the stars. And, and likewise, skippers, uh, the captains of, of the ship still being trained in this? Scale? Oh, absolutely. And navigators are trained all the time. And uh, likewise, in terms of one of the um, the uh, best means of uh, acquiring your, your latitude is actually uh, taking the elevation of the sun at midday and that will bring you to uh, where you are on a latitude and then uh, a number of fixes before and after that will give you a relative position where you are at a particular position in the world. So the use of actually traditional means still is core to our development within the Naval Service and it's built on that premise that you don't know what resources will be to, available to you. And the other piece too which would be very much I suppose a common to both services is the actual fundamental importance of the Mark I eyeball. You know, increasingly I, I see, um, I suppose, events which happen in terms of near misses or actually collisions are events that occur between both military and merchant navy where the, the missing piece was the human element whereby there was an over-reliance on technology and a failure to actually look out the window, the bridge window of the ship and see actually what's happening in front of your face. And I can think of a number of quite tragic outcomes in, in recent years where the, the key element that was actually not upheld was the lookout reporting properly in terms of what was happening in the space around us using your eyes. Can you think of any such examples that happened in Irish waters? Can you give these examples? I can recall examples in Irish waters. I, I, I have to be careful. It's not a huge community that we're talking to and I have to be careful not to point a finger in a particular direction because I think people will be very quickly able to um, calculate what incident I, I am talking about. But I do recall um, quite formidable ships tra traveling at high speed through thick fog and not being uh, aware of actually where they were relative to the coast and having very near misses in the context of um, not perhaps uh, being as alert as they should be to some fundamentals. And uh, that can happen, you know, where you get a level of comfort uh, your technology is, uh, your autopilot's on, your, your uh, technology is there, but uh, you must also, besides looking out the window, you must also look at your radar from time to time because your radar will show you um, where the coastline is and also a, another, I suppose, key instrument is your uh, echo sounder to see in which water is below the keel because it is um, an embarrassing position to end up with insufficient like uh, water under your keel. And um, I could tell you some stories about uh, events myself. I remember once anchoring quite close in a challenging anchorage and um, the weather suddenly changing and for um, a, a very challenging uh, half an hour or so we were dragging towards a, a, a very challenging shoreline. Fortunately uh, I had a great, great crew. We were able to recover our anchors, get the engine started and move out of that dangerous position uh, to a safer anchorage. Um, but it just taught me a lesson in terms you can never uh, take things for granted and uh, perhaps that's the biggest um, risk to anybody who's involved in a business such as ours is becoming complacent. You must always be alert, you must also always be sensitive to your responsibilities whether it's in command or your predictor function whether you're a watchkeeper or in the engine room of your responsibility to ensure that your part and your contribution to the team uh, ensures the safety of your um, shipmates, but uh, also the safety of the ship itself. And that goes for the military navy as it goes for the merchant navy. And 
there's an added complication with that. It, by its nature, military navies often have to go into challenging environments whereby the pressures are more than just the uh, geophysical nature of the space you're operating and that you may have an enemy who is endeavouring to inflict damage on you with um, a fire and you have to be prepared to deal with that. Uh, and also there is the reality that you sometimes have to be prepared to be offensive in terms of your ability to inflict uh, pressure on others, in particular if you're dealing with a, a, a terrorist or a gun running scenario or a situation whereby you're uh, endeavouring to intercept uh, narcotics uh, or, or, or something along that line. Um, of course, you know, in more recent years we've had very challenging operations in terms of the Mediterranean whereby we bring our capability to bear in the context of the um, attempt to undermine the criminality associated with people smuggling and people trafficking, which is one of the biggest tragedies uh, I, I, in recent years as it, that has been happening in the context of the, uh, I suppose, the migration patterns uh, in, in, uh, in Europe. And there is a misery associated with uh, criminals and networks exploiting the uh, challenging circumstances that people who are forced out for a variety of reasons to try and cross uh, challenging seas like the Mediterranean. And uh, we have been there, we've been uh, endeavouring as part of the European missions Operation SOFIA and before that in terms of bilateral with uh, Italy delivering services. Uh, and, and while there was um, a, a risk and a threat in terms of other actors, the overwhelming challenge on that period was to deal with the massive numbers we had to in terms of saving lives and we we have saved uh, in as a defense forces over 18,000 or around 18,000 people